Come on, let's give the Lord a big God bless you. If you can do so, come on, put your hands together and thank Jesus for his presence. Thank you, Pastor Leo, for this beautiful invitation. Wonderful to be here. Last time I was here was two years ago when we had the One Thing event, and that was a wonderful time. It's good to see uh, Renata and uh, Bruno and Stephanie. So we have wonderful friends here, and I'm thankful for the relationship that I've been able to establish, and I know that you recommended me to come here, so thank you, uh, Bruno. We appreciate the role that you have in Central Florida and the leadership God has given you as well. Well, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight. Amen? Can we do so? So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. We recognize, Holy Spirit, that without you, we can do nothing. And so I thank you, Spirit of God, that you're the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I pray, Holy Spirit, may Jesus be magnified in this house tonight. I thank you for the work of the Lord. I thank you for the passion, the zeal. I thank you for the hunger and the thirst that this house has. And I thank you, Lord, that out of this house, you will raise up forerunner messengers. Raise up, Lord God, messengers with the spirit of Elijah upon them. Those that would be willing, Lord God, to deny themselves, surrender everything in this day and this hour. I thank you for people in this hour that understand, O oh Lord, that you're calling us to seek the kingdom and not the American dream. To seek, Lord God, your, your presence, Lord, not popularity, not, Lord, acceptance in the culture. I thank you that this is a new hour, and Holy Spirit, you're making to us such clarity that things have shifted in the spirit realm. And I thank you, Lord God, that you're always faithful to point us to the Lord. And so tonight I ask, let Jesus be magnified, not a, not a singer. Not a musician, not a speaker, not a minister, but Jesus and Jesus alone. This is our prayer, and everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew 25. Let's begin there. We're going to go to Matthew in chapter 25. This has been something that's been on my heart for the last couple of weeks. I've had the great opportunity to speak at the Bible school here the last couple of weeks. I'll be speaking again this Wednesday. And this Thursday night, and we've been talking about eschatology, God's plan for the last days, because the Holy Spirit is raising up a people that are going to be aware of what God's plan is in this hour. On Friday night, I'm the director, by the way, for those of, those of you that don't know who I am, my wife and I were the directors of the Orlando House of Prayer. We started a church in April of 2000, and in 2016, we fell from the Lord to uh, turn our church over to our associate pastors, our assistant pastor, and, um, and since 2016, we've been running a prayer ministry. I do get to travel extensively, and I do get to uh, just provoke the church uh, to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying prophetically in this day and this hour. So I value and I'm so appreciative of, of, the, of the pastoral ministry, uh, but at the same time, I understand that the Lord wants to provoke the body of Christ and churches and pastors for what this shift that God is doing. So if you look with me at Matthew chapter 25, and you can stop there, brother. We'll call you back here in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Give him a big God bless you and a thank you. Amen. You can stay there if you want. That's fine. Because, all right. Matthew 25. Um, I spoke on Friday night at the Orlando House of Prayer. We have a very small prayer room right now. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be breaking ground in the next three months to be able to build a prayer room. Uh, that can hold a little bit more than what we have right now, but we're thankful. Uh, our prayer room is open 80 hours a week, and we focus primarily on prayer, worship, and equipping God's people for what the Lord is saying. Those of you that are familiar with Mike Bickle in the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, Mike's a very good friend of mine, and he comes every year to Orlando. Uh, he's coming, as a matter of fact, next week and next Friday, and uh, always speaks to the Church of Central Florida, speaks to the intercessors. Um, he is really an apostle of prayer in the United, really worldwide. They've been holding 24-7 prayer and worship since 1999. Can you imagine that? N non-stop. This is the 17th year. Non-stop since 19... No, no. Tw this will be the 20 sec uh, 22nd year. 22 years of non-stop prayer and worship. The music has not stopped for one second. Literally. The music has not stopped for one second. Amen? 
And the Lord is doing that all across the nations of the earth, not just in Kansas City. Every major city in America has a house of prayer that's dedicated primarily to prayer. And the purpose of the house of prayer is to, is to saturate the atmosphere uh, so that God would move. And it's not only through houses of prayer that God's listening to prayers, but prayer ministries that are dedicated to prayer really have a, a special place in the heart of the Lord. And I may touch a little bit on that, but Matthew 25, as we're going to see, does correlate to that. Matthew 25 and verse 1, this is the parable of the ten virgins. And um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard a message about the ten virgins, but if not, I pray this blesses you. Look at verse number 1. I'm so glad that this is the English service. Amen. I'm so glad. Thank you very much, Pastor, for the inv invitation. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins. Now, we have to get the context correct. When Jesus is teaching here, there are no d chapters dividing what he's trying to say. So he just finished teaching in Matthew 24. All of Matthew 24, the entire chapter of Matthew 24 is about the end times. It's about the coming of Jesus. It's about... The signs, Jesus was coming out of the temple in Matthew 24, and the disciples said to Jesus, do you see the beautiful buildings and the beautiful temple buildings and this gorgeous temple? Isn't it wonderful, Lord, that we have this privilege to be able to worship in such a beautiful structure? And then Jesus looked at the buildings, looked at his disciples. He says, I tell you the truth, the day is coming that there's not going to be one stone left upon each other. And then Jesus kept walking. It stunned the disciples. They were stunned at such a comment. Jesus kept walking, went down the Kidron Valley, went up, ascended the Mount of Olives there by the Garden of Gethsemane. Who's ever been to the Mount of Olives before? So you know what I'm talking about. It's a beautiful location. Goes up the Mount of Olives and where he would always hang out with his disciples and rest there, teach there. So they get to the Mount of Olives and they rest and they're looking towards the eastern gate. And they're looking towards the temple mount. And as they sat there, the disciples asked them, because they were bothered. What, what did he mean? I mean, it's probably a good 20, 30-minute walk. 20-minute walk from leaving the temple to, to their resting place on the Mount of Olives. Say 20 minutes or so. And during those 20 minutes, I can imagine all the questions going through the minds of the disciples. What did he mean by that? How, why would God allow our temple to be destroyed? We are the chosen people of God. When would this take place? Who would dare do such a thing? We have favor with the Roman government. Why would the Lord allow this to take place? And so when they finally get to the Mount of Olives, the disciples ask Jesus, hey, tell us when this is going to happen. What is going to be the signs of this taking place? And when is the sign of your coming, your return? And this is... Je this is where we're picking up right now. Jesus gives them all these signs. It is the most, most information-filled passage of Scripture in all of the Bible about the end times is Matthew 24. And it's, it, would, it, would, it would be wise of us to master chapter 24. We teach on eschatology several times a year at the Orlando House of Prayer. Um, we're getting ready to start a new internship in the month of February, and one of the key subjects that we always teach is the book of Revelation. Every Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, we do a two-hour prayer set with music, and we read through the book of Revelation, and we sing the book of Revelation. We've been doing that for two years now, where we read the book of Revelation, we read two chapters, then we sing what we just read. Then we pick up, then we do another two chapters. So we're familiar with the book of Revelation. The reason why we do that is because Jesus said in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus said it. In Revelation 1, verse 3, blessed is he who reads, hears, and keeps the words of this prophecy. Blessed is the man who hears. Blessed is the man that reads. And blessed is the one after he reads and understands, keeps the message, the urgency of of the book of Revelation. And I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit is desiring to inform the church, especially the Western church. Because if, we could, if I could be honest with you, we are a distracted people. We're a distracted church in America. Well, you know, you may say, well, we got a nice church building, we have good ministry, and that's wonderful. We're, there's nothing, we need to have that. But even in our many blessings, you can be distracted. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 
the Lord warned the Israelites. He said, when you get in the land that I promised that you would possess, and when you possess the trees and the fruit of the land that you didn't have to sow for or reap for, it was already there when you arrived. When you go and possess cities that you did not have to build and you take over homes and buildings that you had no construction programs for, it's given to you as you overcome the enemies. When you go in there and as you begin to increase and prosper, Here's the warning of the Lord in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 18. Be careful not to forget the Lord your God. Be careful not to forget that it is the Lord your God who has given you the power to prosper and to gain wealth for the purpose of establishing his covenant. Beloved, if you're a prospering man of God, if you're a prosperous woman of God, God has given you the ability to gain wealth so that you can do something with that wealth and build God's kingdom. I believe that. I believe that too many of us are, are living for the moment. We live for this hour. You know, I did a, um, I did a calculation one day because you know, I, I, I desire to live every moment of my life to honor the Lord. I desire that. I don't care about popularity. I don't care about being rich. I don't care about social status because none of those things I'm going to take with me. The only thing that I will take with me is the knowledge of God that I have in here. And when I stand before the Lord... Not one of my congregants or my partners, financial partners, not one of them will stand before the Lord for me and vouch for me. The one who's going to speak for me is the Lord himself. Jesus said this to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He began each of the letters, and I believe that those seven letters are valid for today. We should be reading the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation applies for us today and will help us to be equipped to live in the hour when darkness is coming upon even North America. Jesus began each of those seven letters by saying this, I know your works and I know your labor. I know your works. Jesus knows our stuff. He knows what's in our heart. Jesus knows what makes us tick. He knows what's the passions of our heart. And the purpose of those seven letters is to prepare us to be ready for the most incredible event that's going to take place in all of human history. And that's the marriage of the Lamb of God. Beloved, there's a wedding coming. There is a wedding coming. And those of you that are women... And you know, and those of you that are married, you know what I mean by that. You know that you lived to prepare for your wedding day. And those of you that are engaged, you're looking forward. And maybe you're already beginning to plan for your wedding day. And those of you that are young, young women, you're looking and you're, you're, you can't wait to put that ring on your finger when someone asks you to marry them. And you can't wait to begin to plan for your wedding day, the banquet table and all the favors and the bridesmaids dresses and all the things that go along with preparing for a wedding. Beloved, let me tell you something. Preparing for the Lamb of Jesus is not something that just happens overnight when the rapture happens. We prepare ourselves now. There's a preparation taking place right now. And we need to look at this life that God has given us. We need to look at the freedoms that God has given us in America as an opportunity to prepare. All of Scripture is about one main theme. I will get to Matthew 25, I promise. All of Scripture, all of human history is about one main event. I don't think we realize this. I don't think most Christians realize this. This is the main event that God is preparing for. As a matter of fact, go with me first to the book of Ephesians. And you can keep your finger in there in Matthew 25. Go with me to Ephesians in chapter 1. And I'll show you what is the dream of God. This is what burns in the heart of the Lord. This is what the Lord is, all, all of human history events is planning. One scripture here in Ephesians chapter 1. And go with me if you will, verse 10. Ephesians 1 and verse 10. I'm sorry, it's not 13, it's verse 10. 
It says this in verse number 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Listen to this. This is the dream of God. God's dream is to gather everything in one. All things in Christ. Both the things which are in heaven and the things which are in the earth. There's a dream of God, and that dream is oneness. It's union. There's a day coming when the new Jerusalem will come down out of the sky. And the throne of the Father, not just the throne of Jesus, but the throne of the Father will come down and right hover right over the earth. You see, we've been taught, oh, when we die, we'll spend all of eternity in heaven. We're not going to heaven. Heaven's coming to earth. That's what we don't realize. We're not going to spend eternity. Yes, when we die, you know, we have this interim period where our spirit goes to glory in heaven. But when... When, when the Father is going to establish the kingdom of God on the earth, eternity is coming to heaven. And the new earth is going to be restored and renovated by the glory of God right after the millennial kingdom. I don't think we realize that. I don't think we understand the plan of God. And when we understand God's plan for eternity, we will understand that everything from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation is about one main theme. It's about a wedding. God's planning a wedding for his son. This is the dream of the father. Just like, you know, for example, I have two go gorgeous daughters. And, you know, the dream of a father is to make sure the dad can give the best wedding he can for his son. That's the dream of a dad, is to prepare a wedding for his son. Do you think God the father is any different God the Father desires to prepare the most extravagant, the most glorious, the most beautiful wedding for his son Jesus. And we have this, the testimony of scripture that gives us this picture. And if we could read the prophetic signs of what's in the heart of God the Father, I am telling you, you and I would live our lives differently. We would have different goals. We would have different zeals. We would be consumed by different passions. Earth began with Adam and Eve, the first wedding. And in Genesis chapter 2, Adam says, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And then the Bible says, And the two shall become one. And the result of that union was authority. The result of that union, a union that it wasn't just between man and a woman. It was a union between God and man. That was, that's what gave them dominion. Dominion doesn't just come because of husband and wife are one. Dominion comes when God is brought into that equation. And Adam and Eve had authority and dominion because they were one with God. So much so that every day God would come and have fellowship with Adam. In the garden, Adam would hear God walking in the garden in the day. And God would say, hey, hey Adam, where are you? Let's fellowship. We know, you know the story. But the moment fellowship is broken, we hide from God. We hide from God's presence. And we try to cover up our nakedness by being religious. And we'll try to cover up our spiritual our lack of spirituality by being busy for God there's nothing wrong with being busy for God but I'd rather have God say to me Carlos Carlos you've chosen the better thing you've chosen not to be busy you've chosen to sit at my feet that's what Jesus said to Mary over Martha I don't want to just be busy doing God's work because the main work beloved the main work is being busy for him encountering him the best Martha's are first Mary's. In other words, the best workers are lovers. Just like the first story in the book of Genesis began with the wedding, Adam and Eve, that gives us an indication what's in the heart of the Father. I'm preparing a wedding, and there's a day coming where all of heaven and earth will become one with my son, with God. 
And then throughout the Bible, all throughout the prophets, what's the prophet saying? The, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, all the prophets are saying, return, O backsliding wife. Return, O backsliding bride. Isaiah 56, God says to the people of Israel, to the nation, I am your husband. You are my bride. Return to me. All throughout the prophets, God is endeavoring to bring back a wafered, unfaithful wife. Again, painting the picture. God's dream is man and God to be one. It's not a coincidence that the first miracle of Jesus was, it wasn't opening a blind eye. It wasn't raising somebody from the dead. But the first miracle of Jesus, of all the miracles that Jesus did, he chose to turn water into wine at a wedding. At a wedding. And there were six big, you know, what do you call them? Uh, what is it? Jars of, of stone. Six. Six is the number of man. Six is also the number of 6,000. I believe that Jesus comes at the end of the 6,000th year, going into the seventh millennial. And it's not a coincidence that Jesus turns six jars of wine. And when they taste the wine at a wedding, they say, you have saved the best wine for last. Beloved, we're living in an hour that the Holy Spirit is revealing the best wine for the last day church. And that wine of the last day church is to understand God is not satisfied with just being busy for God. Oh, you want to refresh the heart of God? You want to satisfy God? Here's how you do. Mark 12, 30. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's how you satisfy God's heart. When we learn to become lovers of God and be consumed with his presence. When, we, when we're consumed and, you know, and, and, and when Jesus was asked what's the greatest commandment, he did not reply to a suggestion. He replied to a commandment. There's a day coming. Jesus is going to fulfill that commandment. Jesus will have a church who will be a bride and she will be lovesick for the Lord. She'll be drunk on the wine of intimacy. Hallelujah. That's a good, that's a good drunk in this week. It's okay. Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, which is an excess, but be filled or be drunk with the Holy Ghost. Be drunk with the, with the oil or the wine that the Holy Ghost is serving or giving revelation to right now. I believe the greatest number one item on God's agenda that the Spirit of God is desiring to reveal to the church at large, and especially Western society, is the revelation that God wants to connect with his people as the bride of Christ. And Paul comes along the scene, and he's the one that God uses. Of all the apostles, Paul gets, Paul gets the revelation that we are to be one with God as a man and a woman are one with the Lord. Paul's the one that unveiled the mystery. Paul calls it the mystery, the revelation of the mystery. And the revelation of the mystery included Jew and Gentile becoming one. But even greater than that was man becoming one with God. That God was going to restore once again the, the, the conditions of the Garden of Eden. And that God will once again have union with God but for all of eternity. And then book of Revelation ends with this statement in Revelation 22 verse 17. The spirit and the bride. It doesn't say the spirit and the church. Doesn't say the spirit and believers. Doesn't say the spirit and followers. Doesn't say the spirit and church members. It says the spirit and the bride. There's an hour coming, and I believe it now is, that the Lord is awakening and he's presenting a cup of wine to each and every one of us. He's presenting a cup. I remember I was in Portland, Oregon, and I, I leave, I go, I'm in Portland next week. And I was in Portland, Oregon, ministering. 
and you know, and I was in a hotel room just spending time with the Lord, and I have this vi- no, I was sleeping, it was a dream. I, I'm having this dream, and when I, I wake up out of the dream, and I'm continuing to see this dream, the dream turned into a vision, and in this vision, I saw myself just, just sitting there, and then all of a sudden, I saw a hand up here and I could see the white sleeve of a robe of the hand and in the hand there was a beautiful goblet and I heard the Lord's voice say take and drink and I knew it was an invitation to the blood of Jesus to wash me and to cleanse me and to give me a clean conscience and I remember in this vision I saw myself reach out for the cup and I drank it and then I saw the Lord says, I saw another, the same hand, but with, another, with a different goblet. And the Lord says, take Carlos and drink. And I remember as I looked at the goblet, I thought twice about it because I knew it was much deeper significance than just a cup of salvation. But I was hungry. I was passionate. I said, yes, Lord, I'll drink. But I remember thinking about it. So I took the cup and I drank it. And then he presented with me another, another cup, a third cup. He says, Carlos, take and drink and I knew that that cup represented the cup of sacrifice the cup of death to self and I remember thinking oh Lord oh Lord I don't know if I can he says Carlos I'll help you and I remember him gently helping my hand grab the cup and he gently held the bottom of the cup and he helped me to drink it and then he offered me a fourth cup he says Carlos take and drink And when I saw that cup, I knew that that cup meant complete oneness with God. And I trembled and said, Lord, I can't do this on my own. And then I heard the Lord say this, Carlos, I will help you drink the cup of fellowship. This is what the Lord is doing, beloved. Now look at Matthew 25. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Matthew. 25 look at verse number one again Jesus is saying this right after giving instruction about the end times this is an end time parable he's continuing about the end times look what he says verse one the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins the kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So this is a passage about the end times because this is a passage about the bridegroom coming and desiring to invite the virgins to a wedding. He goes on to say this. They're like 10 virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Now the five, now five of the virgins were wise and five were foolish and those who were foolish they took their lamps but they had no oil with them so five of them they all had their lamps ten of them but five were foolish because they did not have oil now oil in scripture is symbolic of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Revelations 4 and 5 says that John saw, saw around the throne seven lampstands, which are the seven spirits of God. So a lampstand for us is symbolic of our vessel, our life, our heart. In, Re- in Revelation 4, 5, the seven lampstands were the fire of the Holy Ghost. It was the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know what the seven spirits of God is, go to, you can turn to it later on, Isaiah chapter 11, 2 and 3. The seven spirits of God are mentioned there. But the seven spirits of God are symbolically around the throne of the Lord in a lampstand. And here we have ten virgins, symbolic of the church or religious people. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps, but had no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to us, do we have sufficient oil in our vessels? Do we have sufficient oil in our vessels? Verse 5, but while the bridegroom slept or delayed, they all slumbered. And at midnight a cry was heard, 
that said, Behold, the bridegroom is now coming. Go out to meet him. Then those virgins, they arose and they trimmed their lamps. That word trim, it means to decorate their lamps, prepared their lamps. They dressed their lamps. I'm going to touch on that here in a moment. Are we dressing our lamps? Are we preparing our lamps for the day when we hear the shout of the bridegroom saying, He's coming! Verse 8, And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, answering, No, lest there should not be enough oil for us and for you. But rather go yourselves to those who sell the oil and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy or to look for oil, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, notice that those who were ready went with him to the wedding and then the door was shut. And afterwards the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. And then listen to what Jesus says. This is how I know this is an end time passage. Watch, therefore, for you do not neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So what is the wisdom found here in this passage? Because I want to be found ready. I don't want to, you know, miss the coming of the Lord. Or, you know, I believe, that, I believe that there are many, many numerous Christians that are not ready for the coming of the Lord, but will still make glory, still make heaven. But they'll list, miss out on so many rewards. I don't want to miss out on rewards. I don't want to miss out on what God has for me. I don't want to live my life for just now. I want to live with eternity in mind. The average span in America, the average lifespan in America is 78.8 years. Women live 78.9 years. Men live 78.7 years. So you guys have us by like two months. So the average lifespan in America is 78.8. And so I wanted to figure out what does that mean? How does that calculate when it comes to eternity? And I remember that Peter said, one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. So I try to figure that out. Okay, so if one day is a thousand years, that means 24 hours, which is one day, is like 1,000 years. Then that means 12 hours would be equivalent to 500 years. That means six hours was 250 years, and three hours was 125 years. I wanted to find out how, long, how much was 78.8 years according to that timetable. Do you know how much time God has given the average American? One hour, 48 minutes, and 54 seconds. That's how long, from God's perspective, we live. One hour, 48 minutes, and 54 seconds. And when, when, I, when, I re, when I realized that, I said, Lord, help me to spend my one hour and 48 minutes and 54 seconds in a way that's honoring to you. I want to honor you with the little, Paul says, redeem the time, for the days are evil. We just had an election, and we know what happened. The days are evil among us. The days are evil among us. Just because we live in America, we're not guaranteed no persecution. Here we have a story in Matthew 25. The Lord reveals to us that those that do not have sufficient oil will not be ready for what's coming. What does oil symbolize? We, I already told you, Revelation 4 and 5, oil symbolizes the ministry, the life, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Oil symbolizes the ability to receive healing of the soul, healing of the mind, healing of the wound. Remember the Good Samaritan. In Luke 10, 34, he poured in oil and wine. For the stranger that was left half dead, 
and paid for him to be to, to, for his recovery. What does, else does oil do? Oil illuminates. It gives light. It shows us truth. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit heals. The Holy Spirit reveals. He illuminates. Revelation, I mean Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What else does oil do? Oil beautifies that's what oil does. Remember that we read? They got up and they trimmed their lamps. They dressed their lamps. They, they, they decorated their lamps. That was a custom, to decorate their lamps as they were going towards the wedding feast, the wedding, the, the, the wedding ceremony. The, they would get up and put flowers or whatever they did. They dressed their lamps. Here's what Revelations 19, 7 and 8 says when Jesus comes back for his wedding. Let us rejoice and be glad. Give glory to God, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Just like no woman who's going to get married and has already her wedding date, she does not just show up or wait for her husband-to-be to show up and pick her up and go to the wedding ceremony. No, she prepares. She goes out. It's costly. It takes time. There's preparation involved, appointments to go, reservations to make, stores to go visit. How many store wedding dresses she'll try on until she says, that's the one. There's much preparation for a wedding, beloved. Let's not just, we oh, whenever he's going to come, he's going to come. When that day comes, that's not preparation. That's wishful preparation, wishful thinking. Rejoice and be glad. Give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready and it was given to her to be clothed, dressed, trimming. We trim the lamps of our heart, decorating our lives. It was given to her to be clothed in fine linen, bright and clean. If you think we can go into a wedding tattered, wrinkled, spotted, manchas, arrugas. If we think we can go into the wedding, just, well, whenever he shows up, he shows up. Beloved, yeah, you may be able, you may, by the grace of God, go in, but how much will you lose? It was given to her to be clothed. And fine linen, bright, clean, for the fine linen are the righteous acts, the deeds, the righteous works of the saints. Oil also refreshes, it satisfies. Remember when Jesus went to a Pharisee's house to eat? And he walked in there, and the Pharisee didn't. Why didn't have the lowest servant of the house wash his feet? No oil for his head. The reason why they put oil back then because the sun was hot, cracky. And you crack, your skin is cracked. You smell. The oil was beautified with different kind of ointments to make you smell good. It refreshed you. He walks in. Jesus, this honorable rabbi, walks in. No oil, no water. And then a sinful woman walks in who recognized the power of the love of God. She walks in and she begins to weep on Jesus' feet and wash his feet with her tears. And she begins to anoint his head with oil. And Jesus says, the one who understands the power of the blood and knows how much they've been forgiven, they're going to love me much. But the ones that just say, yeah, I thank the Lord I got saved and he saved me, delivered me 25 years ago. I thank the Lord for my prosperity. Oh, God's been blessing me. Oh, man, I've been working very hard and, you know, just, you know, going hard after it. And, you know, I can't go to church all the time because I'm so busy with my business. So busy, you know, starting a new thing with this or that. Oh, how's your prayer life? My prayer life, it's okay. It's okay, you know. You know, I get to spend maybe a couple of minutes, you know, a couple of, you know, every so often. Beloved. 
Do we understand what Jesus has done for us? Jesus said to the one who's been forgiven much will love much. To the one who's been forgiven little will love little. I want to love much. I don't have to be a murderer to love much to understand how much God has forgiven me. Because what one lie will send me to hell if it's not repented of. Oil releases pleasant odor, odors. Oil is a sign of an extravagant sacrifice. On the Last Supper, Jesus is sitting with his disciples. And Mary of Bethany gets up. And she takes a whole year's worth of fragrant oil, spikenard. And she pours it upon Jesus. And the Bible says the odor filled the room. You know what happened? The disciples began to attack her and criticize her. Why did you do this? It could have been sold for a whole bunch of money. We could have fed hundreds, if not thousands of poor people. Because what she gave was about a year's worth of salary. Some say it was her inheritance that her, fa her father had left to her. She sacrificed it all. It filled the atmosphere. You know what? Something lovers will always convict disciples. I'm going to say that again. You get a lover, a disciple who's a lover, that lover's, that lover's worship, that lover's lifestyle, that lover's prayer lifestyle is going to convict a disciple who's very busy for God. They began to criticize her, attack her. But Jesus came to her defense and said, leave her alone. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached, to the ends of the earth, whatever she has done, it will be told as a memorial. Believe, I'm telling you the most powerful thing, the most powerful tool to be able to be effective in evangelism, and I believe in world missions, is when world missions is coupled with intimacy with Jesus and prayer. Wherever you have evangelism, where it's coupled with, with worship and intercession, you're going to have much effect there. But if you have a lot of missionaries just doing a lot of the work, just passing out tracts and witnessing and not, not mixed with intercession and worship, I believe the last days will be, will be marked with a triumphant church that is so busy about being in the presence of the Father. I believe this is what the Lord desires for each and every one of us. I know it's already 6.20. We have 6.30, right? Let me tell you a story and then if I can have my brother come back to the keyboard. Let me tell you why I'm so passionate about this. Let me tell you why I've, I've been willing to pretty much, Bruno and Stephanie, they know my story. They know what happened to me. 2005, after, four, after just celebrating five years, four, four years of a church, church was growing by leaps and bounds. We had just purchased 21 acres, bought debt-free, paid for, had half a million dollars in the bank, a church of just four years old. We had about 600 members in those four years back in Okoe. And so the church was prosperous. It was growing financially. We were getting ready to go into a building program. Then all of a sudden, in May of 2005, I, have an in, I had a personal encounter with the Lord. I don't have time to go into it. But I will just say this. And this will let you know why I spoke and what I spoke tonight. But in this encounter, an angel walked into my bedroom and my spirit came out of my physical body. I found myself, so there's many things that happened between the time my, my spirit came out and I find myself in heaven. I find myself in heaven and I see two individuals about from here to the keyboardist, 20 feet away from me, 15, 20 feet away from me. I didn't see their faces, but I knew who they were. I knew that one was the Father and one was Jesus. And I remember thinking to myself, what am I doing here? Why? I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be in their presence. But what puzzled me was they did not recognize me. They didn't even acknowledge my presence. I was puzzled by that. And I remember thinking, what do I do? Should I run to them? Should I fall down and worship? Because they were talking, but I couldn't hear anything. They were standing having a conversation. And all of a sudden, behind me, I heard this authoritative voice. And the voice said this to me. To you, it's been granted to stand here and listen. When I heard that voice, immediately my ears opened up and I heard their conversation. And they were talking about the end times. They were talking about the coming tribulation to the nations of the earth. They were talking about 
the tribulation that even many believers will suffer. I'm not going to touch on my point of eschatology. But they were talking about the coming suffering that many nations will go through. Like it's happening right now in the Middle East, in China, in North Korea. Many Christians are suffering horrifically. They were also talking about the rise of the Antichrist and the signs of the times. And I was puzzled. Why am I hearing this? This is not important to me. Why am I hearing this? Then all of a sudden the conversation shifted. And they were talking about the bride and the bridegroom. And when they began to talk about the relationship between God and man, that got my attention. My heart began to race as I began to realize, wait a second, I'm not sure I'm prepared to be part of the bride. I'm not sure that I'm really at the place that I need to be intimately with Lord. And then all of a sudden, the most glorious but the most horrific words I ever heard was sounded when I heard the Father say to Jesus, and he said this, It's time, son. Go get your bride. And when I heard that, I flipped. I felt terror. I be, literally, I remember in this encounter, I began to shake violently. And I felt, I felt terror. I didn't feel fear. I felt terror. And I was, and I was puzzled. I, I should be happy. I should be rejoicing. He's saying, go get your bride. That means go get your church. And my body responded in such a way that I was confused. Because when the Father said that to Jesus, it's time, son. I'll never forget it. He looked at this. It's time, son. Go get your bride. And when he said that, I saw fire come out of his mouth. And it was a ball of fire. And I remember the ball of fire went out of his mouth, went straight, made a U-turn, and I knew that it was coming towards me. And the closer that ball of fire came, I began to shake more violently. When that hit ball of fire hit my midsection, I screamed at the top of my lungs. And I said, no, we're not ready. I mean, I yelled it, no, we're not ready. And when I said that, I revealed the condition of my own heart. I realized, now this is, this is 2005. I've known Jesus since 1981. I've been preaching full-time in ministry since 1986. I wasn't a newbie in the faith. I wasn't a newbie in the ministry. This is my 40th year in Jesus. This is my 35th year in full-time ministry. And I began to realize I'm not prepared for what it means to be part of the bride of Christ. And I began to realize, right now, I'm a son of God. Yeah, when you, every one of us, when we came to Jesus, we, became, we were infants, babes in Christ. And then we grew to be children of God. And then we grew to be servants of God. And then we grew to be sons of God. And when we're sons of God, we can handle the inheritance. But beloved, there's a higher place than sonship. It's called brideship. When we're completely one with the Lord. And everything we have means nothing. Our houses mean nothing. Our retirement account means nothing. Our stocks mean nothing. Our businesses mean nothing. It's nothing in comparison to the excellency of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. Paul says, I consider everything like dung. I, I, I got titles. I was a Pharisee. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm an Israelite of Israelites. I got popularity. People know me. I'm full of knowledge. I got titles. But it's nothing in comparison to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, beloved. I'm here to tell you. There's a work that has taken place in the nations of the earth. And that's to prepare you and I to be part of the bride. This is an hour. This is a season. I'm not going to say 2021, a new resolution, because every day is a new hour, a new season. You can make a brand new resolution whenever you want. But I'm telling you, this is an hour to make a resolution in your heart. I'm going to know God.
I'm going to be a God chaser. I'm going to be a God lover. I'm going to be a God seeker. I'm going to put God first in my life. This is a season, beloved. Hear me now. There's trouble on the horizon. Whether you see it or not, there is difficulty coming. There is pressure coming to the American church. Become an expert at knowing God. Ask the Lord, Holy Spirit. I speak to the Holy Ghost every day. He's my best friend. I speak to him because Jesus is not on the earth. Jesus is in heaven. The Holy Spirit's on the earth. Talk to the Holy Spirit every day. Talk to the Holy Ghost. He's the one that reveals Jesus. He's the one that puts priorities in the right place. And I'm here to tell you tonight, there's a wedding coming. And the Father's preparing the wedding. Do you know who, do you know who the best man for the wedding is? The Holy Spirit. John the Baptist. He was the best man for Jesus at the first coming. He says, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. The bridegroom, all he does is get ready for the coming wedding. I must decrease. He must increase. Beloved, the Holy Ghost is always lifting up Jesus. And this is the hour to say, Holy Spirit, touch my life. Why don't we all stand to our feet if we can. Oh, lift up your hands before the Lord right now. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. If the worship team want to come up here, they can as well. Jesus, we bless you. Come on, right now, begin to cry to the Lord. Ask the Lord to speak to your heart. Ask the Lord to touch you right now. He's coming right now. The Holy Spirit wants to visit your life afresh. I see the Lord moving in and out of these chairs and in and out of these aisles right now. Right where you're at, the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm going to touch you. And I'm going to make you into a lover of God. I'm going to make you into a seeker. I'm going to make you into a pursuer. The Lord says, fear not. Fear not. I know how to touch your life. Fear not, says the Spirit of God. I know how to make you into a God lover. I know how to touch you in such a way that I can help you destroy and deny certain desires. I know how to do it, says the Lord. Oh, just look to me. Cry out to me in this hour. And I will do something within you that you cannot do. I will cause you to come to my presence and to call upon me in such a way that you will have your life so overflowing with joy. The joy of the wine that I will present to you in this hour. The Lord says, come and ask. I will handle the areas of your emotions. I will handle the struggles in your heart. I will handle and I will give you the grace to have victory over the temptations, even of your own heart. The Lord says, some of you think, oh Lord, I've been crying out, I've been, do I've been asking, I just can't overcome this. The Lord says, by my grace, you will overcome in this hour, in this season. I will give you victory, says God. Young men, young women, the Lord says, I will give you victory for purity. Purity of heart is coming. Some of you are struggling with areas in your heart, but the Lord says, I will put the spirit of grace and the spirit of purity within your hearts and within your eyes. And the Lord says, I will cause you to walk in such a way that your heart will not condemn you. Your mind will not cause you to be shamed, but I will cause grace in this hour to seek and to pursue me, says the Lord. Oh, come on, lift up your hands before God and say, here I am, Jesus. Do that in me. Do that in me. Do that in me. Come on, ask the Lord to do that in me. That's right, he's doing that. Can we just sing one song? Can we sing one quick song? And then as we sing this one song, I want those of you that are saying, yes, Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to be a, a God seeker. I'm going to ask the Lord to be a lover of God. I want to be a lover of God. I want my life to be transformed. Perhaps you know that the Lord is dealing with you about something. This is the season. I'm answering this prayer call myself. But if that's you as we sing here tonight, I want you to come out of your seats. Come down to this altar and say, here I am, Lord God. I present my lampstand. I want fresh oil. I want fresh oil in my heart. I want to run for you. Come on down. Come on down. Get out of your seat and come on down. Jesus. Come close. Come close. Come close. There's purity. God is putting purity in hearts right now. 
that are here feel free to pray for our people thank you Jesus. can you bring this girl to me right here bring her to me right here thank you jesus lift up your hands honey the lord says to you the favor of your god is upon you and the favor of your god is going to encounter your life and the lord says i will change you and i will cause your heart to be so transformed that your heart will burn as mary's heart burned for me for the spirit of god says i smile over you and i run after you says god and i will do what only i can do says the spirit of the lord in the name of jesus come on lift up your hands to the lord fire the lord come fire the lord come come on let's get your leaders to help pray in Jesus' name, pray for the people. Spirit of God, do. Thank you. Lift your hands. Let's sing this out. Come on, let's worship. Let's worship. Peace. 
Yeshua. for the Lord would say to you my hand is upon you I've set you apart from your mother from your mother's womb I've called you from the day you were conceived says the Lord my eyes fell upon you and even as it says of Moses that he was a beautiful child even as he was very young the Lord says you have been beautiful to me from a young tender age you shall grow up to me says the Lord for the Lord says I've called you even as I called the Nazarite to be set apart and sanctified to live holy unto me for the Lord says I will give you the grace the grace of consecration the grace of holiness and you will be a voice a voice in the hand of your God that you will cause many to hear many to understand many to perceive so the Lord would say Lorenzo my hand is upon you your ears are open your heart will understand and your eyes will see says the Lord give the Lord a shout of praise in the house we ask you that you teach us how to be ready we know these are tough times these are times that we're going to have to stand firm and we need to be ready for the wedding God we want to be spotless we want to walk in righteousness we want to walk in holiness we want to stand firm on the promises that you have made to us so we come today and we repent God of all the wrong thinking of all the wrong actions of all the wrong things that we have spoken God and we declare that we are yours we want to follow you we want to obey you wherever we you go we want to follow whatever you say we want to repeat whoever you touch we want to touch God we are your disciples we are your children so we declare come Holy Spirit come Holy Ghost and set us on fire set us on fires and flames that will never go out set us on fires and make us able to stand and firm and declare the good news of the gospel and preach the message of grace and be ready for the day that you are going to come back for your church Jesus we come with repentance today and we declare call us into righteousness call us into holiness God make us strong and make us bold to live the life that you have for us we say thank you Jesus we say thank you Jesus we say thank you Jesus thank you Jesus can you give Jesus some praise can you give Jesus some praise it could not be it could not be a better message for today for this time it had to be exactly what it was we need to be ready we need to be ready we need to be ready the worship team they're gonna the keyboard is gonna continue to play you guys are here feel free to continue to pray I love you guys we have another service so I have to dismiss you I love you guys I will see you here next Sunday at 5 p.m. I love you all